and welcome to Book Club Live. Um, tonight we're with Helen Lewis for Difficult Women, a history of feminism in 11 fights. Um, it's part of our series of salons that we're doing um, throughout lockdown um, and that we've been running uh, since the beginning of lockdown. I'm um, Helen Bagnall, I'm the founder of Book Club Live and also um, one of the co-founders of Salon London and the Also Festival where I know I've met um, a lot of you. Um, it tends to be all of the work that we do at Salon and also in a book club live are all about big books and good times. Um, and tonight is a really big book. Uh, big book is kind of an industry uh, word or in industry description for books they expect to do really, really well. And uh, Helen Lewis's book is definitely a big book. On the good times side of it, I hope that you'll relax. I know Polly's there with her curry, because I've just seen that. I hope you've all got something that you can relax into your Sunday night. I've got a cup of tea. Um, I know sometimes people have a glass of wine or a non-alcoholic cocktail, but the idea is that you can relax, have a really lovely time with us and understand um, a book and uh, Helen's work a little bit deeper. Uh, it works a little bit like this. I'll be talking to Helen for uh, about um, 30 minutes. We then take a short break so that you can uh, get yourself another cup of tea or have a think about what we've talk talked about. Um, and then we come back and ask um, Helen uh, some questions about some of the things we've spoken about or some of the other things you might want to know about the history of of the fight for feminism. You may notice on your screen that there is a way of getting involved with our comments and questions box. Um, it's very, very easy to use and you can send me private questions if you prefer. Um, and I'll put them to um, Helen in the second half of book club live so helen she is um a staff writer at the atlantic uh, and former deputy editor at the new statesman she's written for the guardian the sunday times uh, the new york times and for vogue um, she's a regular host of bbc radio 4's week in westminster and paper reviewer on the andrew marr show and i was talking to natalie haynes just before we started and she said boy can helen think so we are in really really good hands so I don't know um, what your relationship with feminism is. I don't know which rights you have as a as a woman or or, or um, that you really relish for the women in your family or your friends, whether it's for your right to get an education, the vote, divorce, contraception and abortion. All of these rights have been won rather than awarded. And they mean that we stand on the shoulders of other women and these are um, quite difficult women. Is that right, Helen? Yeah, I mean, the whole reason I wanted to write the book was really to kind of restore some of the complexity to feminist history and to say that it's too easy, I think, as a, you know, a, a feminist. Are you all right? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, as, as to say that, you know, why is everything so disappointing now? Why is politics so hard to do? You know, where are the kind of heroes anymore? And actually, as soon as you look back through the history of feminism, you find that we owe an enormous amount to women that you wouldn't really want to spend any time with. Um, whether that might be through kind of the fact that they were very dictatorial personalities or the fact that they held views that were very, uh, you know, actually out of sync with their time, never mind kind of abhorrent to us now. Or, you know, just the fact that actually sometimes to get things done, you have to be stroppy or obsessive or unyielding. Uh, all of those things that women are kind of told not to be. We're told to be kind of cut quiet and kind and docile and you think this um angle this angle of um difficult women was was missing from the books that were on offer um from uh people who were looking to learn for feminism from from books that were being published like the rebel girl series yeah i mean i didn't really want to start the book by slagging off everyone else who'd ever <laughs> written a feminist book but well uh, yeah. But I did think there was, a, there was a massive publishing boom, actually, kind of in the last couple of years. And it came from a very good intention place, which was let's try and find some stories. For, I mean, Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls just sold like, I mean, Hotcakes doesn't even do it justice. And I think that's it's a lovely thing for a children's book. It's fabulous. And I know loads of people who've got, you know, kids who, you know, and they would never have heard about some of the women in that book. But it struck me when I was reading it, the, the one that kind of finally sent me around the bend was Coco Chanel. And it said, you know, she had a... She had a dream. She wanted to have a fashion business and a wealthy friend lent her some money, uh, you know, and she was taught to sew by the nuns in the convent. That's why she always loved black and white. And you kind of go, OK, but the wealthy friend that she borrowed the money off, he was Jewish and she had him kicked out of the business under the Nazi Aryan laws of the 1930s. She then spent the war in Paris sleeping with a Nazi officer, possibly being a spy herself for that regime. And, I, I, you know, and this was somebody who did what she had to do to survive. She collaborated with an abhorrent regime 
and the cl the clothes are good the clothes are beautiful but you know you can rinse that story down for for children i think that's that's you know there's one argument to be had there but i think as adults we should be really clear about the fact that coco chanel is an incredibly complicated character mm, it's a really interesting point i just hadn't thought of it in that way we love heroes and and yeah. and it's you know it's so easy to want them you know with every tiny little rewrite to be a little bit better and a little bit more seductive and a little bit more heroic well, I think that's the discussion that we're having now, um, you know, as we're talking about statues and about what's kind of going on there and, and trying to kind of come up with this version of history where it's a sort of ledger where, you know, was Churchill good or bad? You know, was, uh, you know, uh, and, and in some cases, in the case of the, the statue that came down of Colston in Bristol, you know, there's somebody who's just known for absolutely nothing other than being a slave trader. I think that's a pretty straight up and down case. Why would you celebrate that person in this day and age? But for other people, they will have much more complicated legacies and inevitably someone did a I think the spectator did a sort of troll article saying well maybe actually the statue of Millicent Fawcett should come down because she went to report on the Boer War and she didn't write about the concentration camps that were, were there at the time you know almost nobody comes out of history looking perfectly polished and clean and there has to be some kind of accounting about how do we celebrate the achievements without necessarily just signing off on everything that that person did which is why your book is such a such a, a brilliant book for now, because it really does go into so many details of uh, the complexity of how we use history, which is so 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 topical right now. We're going to talk about some of this. I'm sure we'll we'll have some questions um, it, um, at any time. Quest we can ask questions at any time. Um, I'm going to cover a few a few areas. I mean, Helen, you've got eleven fights in your book. Was it did it was it always going to be eleven, or was there was it ten and there had to be another one? No, it started. It was subject to a real kind of arms race, kind of mission creep. I think it's actually started off as eight. Um, and then I remembered from the great women's magazine advice that odd numbers are always better. Um, so it became nine. And then actually after I wrote the first draft, um, two of the chapters, the play chapter and the time chapter, were originally kind of mashed together in this unpleasant sense as a chapter about leisure. And a friend of mine said, look, these are two different subjects, particularly time, which I hope we'll talk about. You need to kind of give this the space to breathe. Um, so, yeah, it's a good job that I didn't have any longer to write it. Otherwise, it might have been a history of feminism in you know, 973 fights. <laughs> it might be a sequel. But, I mean, it's some of the things I'm not going to cover, but if if, um, if anyone as part of the book club at home wants to cover, I'm not going to be covering The Vote, which is fantastic. I'm not going to be covering Divorce, even though I really, really wanted to. Um, and um, so... and. Yes, and contraception. So if anyone wants to uh, ask questions about that, I'm sure we can do it in the second half. What I am going to talk about first is time, as you just mentioned. Um, and I love the fact you start that chapter with the quote um, from the Dutch comedian Hester Macarenda mm. saying, my grandmother didn't have the vote, my mother didn't have the pill, and I don't have the time. How did time become a feminist fight, Helen? Well, I, I, I kind of came out of the book feeling actually that was the fight that underpinned all the other ones. Because, you know, why have women found it so difficult to organise politically through time? Well, it is because of the fact that they've been doing, you know, they've been bounded to the home traditionally. And also they've had a huge amount of unpaid caring labour to do. Um, and, and therefore, it's, you know, there's a great quote, which is always attributed to Orwell, like, you know, everything that isn't attributed to Oscar Wilde is, which is, you know, the trouble with socialism is it takes up too many evenings. <laughs> and I felt that was exactly the same thing. You know, the trouble is feminism is that you're trying to fit it in around putting the kids to bed and cleaning the oven and you know and checking in to see whether or not you know your dad's okay because he's been widowed last year all of those things that you know that make society move along tend to fall heavier on on women and and actually you know at the time of the second wave particularly it was astonishing that was a time when huge numbers of women went into the workforce in the 1970s it looked amazing for productivity figures you know it looked great for tax receipts but they were still expected to come home and do what Arlie Hochschild the sociologist called the second shift at the end of the day and it just I mean what she found at the time was was staggering it was essentially a, I think a, a one 24-hour day of unpaid labor you know every month that they were doing they were just doing this huge amount of money and of course it meant that they weren't able to compete in in the workforce because they weren't you know they were, they were doing it with one hand tied behind their back and there's this great quote by the suffragette Hannah Mitchell saying you know I always felt the tyrant who really kept me in subjection was the cooking stove you know, more than any man or any, uh, you know, un unjust law, that was the thing that was holding her back. And, and that's one of the reasons why I find the suffragettes so fascinating, is that for the first time, you know, they paid their organisers. 
So the women that I write about in the, in, you know, they're only about 1500 suffragettes, but they had like a trade union, they had people who you paid subscription money in and they could afford to be full-time activists. And that was genuinely revolutionary for women. There were these women in their twenties who, you know, were single and had money and lived in London and were able to go ice skating and get in hot air balloons and get arrested. And I think it's something that gets left out of the suffragette story is that they were the first group of women who could have that political freedom to organize like that. And it's, you know, when you, there's something really strange when you look back in history, because, because people dress differently to us, because the activists just look differently to us, you really, it's really easy to underestimate the fight. And I think you really put that fight back in there in a way that's so understandable. Well, one of the things that I found out when I was doing the sport chapter, actually, was, you know, the Rational Dress Society in the late 1800s were big advocates of women wearing trousers. And now women wearing trousers is kind of one of those interesting things that happens really and accelerates because of the First World War, when a lot of gender roles broke down simply because so many men were away at the front and then so many men were killed. But the demand of the Rational Dress Society was that women's underwear should weigh only, only seven pounds. Um, And I've just thought this was extraordinary. You know, the fact that you have to imagine that everybody who's doing all of this activism in the, you know, in the 1800s was doing it essentially like wearing, you know, several times that actually that, you know, that's what they wanted to reduce it to. And I went and weighed my underwear and I can't, I think it was 5.5 ounces. That's a, that's a fairly, you know, sturdy bra pants and socks uh, these days. You know, we just, we, it's hard now to think about just those things that, you know, wearing a full length skirt and trying to, play football you know all these things that all the the women who came before us kind of had to do that are totally invisible I've just been reading about the 1970s and you know when there were in the 1970s there about 27 female MPs came in and I think 19 1974 February election they hadn't there was no toilet women's toilet within walking distance of the chamber so Barbara Castle uh, the great Labour politician one of the things that she campaigned for was the fact she was a minister she was a rare female minister her and Shirley Williams uh, in the Callaghan government, that they, um, sorry, under Wilson, um, that she she wanted a loo within walking distance of the chamber because she hadn't spent a huge amount of time at the dispatch box. Um, and they called it Barbara's Castle, which I enjoy enormously. <laughs> but then you get to Cheryl Sandberg's um, book, and she talks about the fact that in 2015, 16, whenever this would be, they go and visit, you know, all the executives that she's with go and visit a venture capital firm. And she says, where's the lady's loo? And they don't know because they only moved into the building six months ago and they're all men. <laughs> And I think about this with, you know, with coronavirus now, that there are huge numbers of women who can't get out of their house now because they've got small kids with them or they've had a few kids themselves. Or, you know, we talk about this, the idea of the bladder leash, right? The thing that keeps women close to their houses and, and prohibits their movement. That has come back because of coronavirus. That, you know, men can, and let's be honest, frequently do have a piss in a bush. But it's not. it's a very different proposition when you're a woman. And because public toilets haven't reopened now in the last couple of weeks since lockdown, women are finding it much harder to get out of the house. And those are the invisible things that really get to me because they're so hard to describe and people think that they're petty, but they're the little tiny prison bars on your life that, that just affect your experience and make it different to that of a man. I was going to ask you if you thought that the, um, this area of time had been uh, much more difficult to manage for women under lockdown. Um, and I hadn't realised that, yeah, every, every woman I asked, do you want to meet in the park? It's like, yes, but only for an hour and a half. Right. <laughs> I, I, th- I mean, I wrote a piece for The Atlantic in early March, which was ended up with the headline, the coronavirus is a disaster for feminism. You know, it's going to send us back to the 1950s. And I got a lot of stick for it, inevitably, as people said this was wildly overwrought. Um, but it has been borne out on the research that's been done since. And the reason that I knew that this was a, this was a problem was I talked to people who'd researched Ebola and Zika in primarily developing countries, plus SARS and MERS in, in, across Asia. And they said exactly the same thing, you know, that, that actually what happens is that if, if, if you're looking at heterosexual couples and someone's sacri- salary has to be sacrificed because kids are home from school, it's usually the woman because she's more likely to be the lower earner and she's more likely to be in part-time or flexible unemployment. You know, the, the effect of lockdowns is enormous on single parents, nine out of ten of whom are, are women. And so it was, it was all totally predictable. And the fact that the government's got itself into this enormous mess about reopening schools should have been predictable, but... It's one of those things where if you're governed by people who, you know, assume that children get taken or, or, or care by of money. by someone else, yeah. that there's some fundamentally someone else's problem, um, then it, these are the kind of decisions that are going to get this kind of slip through the net and not get the gravity that they deserve. So, so um, 
I know it was so shocking that the the, um, <laughs> the idea that nannies could go back to work first was just one of the most shocking things about lockdown um, for me. But um, I mean, who has them? But um, Selma Jones is one of the difficult women that you talk about um, in the Time chapter, and she and she was a, a campaigner for uh, wages for women, which was an organisation I had not really heard about, despite you know understanding you know quite a lot about the seventies uh, wave of feminism, having grown up in the seventies. But I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit like that, and why why don't we know about her? Is it because she is difficult? I think she's really difficult. I mean, Wages for Housework were an explicitly Marxist organization at a time when political, you know, the, the the boundaries of the left were a lot more expansive than they kind of felt they are. Maybe a little bit recently they have opened back up again. But but you know, they were she write her 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 writing is sort of about the kind of, you know, the, about things like the capitalist breathing down our neck and, and that it's it's that kind of very full-blooded socialist rhetoric that I think people afterwards got increasingly nervous about. So there is that, you know, and then there are some very weird views. So the idea basically about wages for housework is, uh, you know, the way I frame it in the book is a precursor of universal basic income. It's essentially the idea, in her case, she thought that women, because she was writing at a time when it was almost exclusively women in the home and men at work, you know, women should be compensated for, for housework. And the things that are quite difficult about that is lots of people argued, well, aren't you going to actually reinstitute the idea that women can stay at home and as long as they're paid for it, it's okay? Isn't true equality about kind of getting women into the workplace? And that's a debate that, you know, can still continually rages today. And, you know, the second thing was that she had an incredibly expansive definition of what housework was. She thought having sex with your partner counted as housework, which sort of made me kind of go, I think you're doing it wrong. I mean, <laughs> I think it's sort of supposed to be enjoyable, actually. <laughs> call me <laughs> call me crazy. But, you know, but 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 she did a really important thing um, and, and injected a Marxism, which is not a word you hear now, really, apart from as used as a sort of boo scare word. Uh, into feminist thought and and the legacy of that is really continues today the idea about labor comes back to um engels who was marx's collaborator writing about the family you know the fundamental unit of control of women is about controlling their ability to have babies you know if you're you can uh, you know this is why we find the story of henry the eighth so ex uh, so exciting because he had absolutely everything and he just couldn't have a, a an heir it's this one power that men just don't have and, and, and they need women for. And that's, you know, to be get Marxist about it, that is the fundamental point of patriarchy. And, you, and I think what you explained so um, brilliantly there is the idea of by having someone who was so uncompromising, so difficult, so you know, radical in their views, but they did widen what we then began, began to think about housework and, as you say, the second shift and who does it and where does it fall in the family. And it's a difficult issue. I think, you know, as you, as you say, you know, no one really wants to think that they're, you know, being exploited by the people they love and the people that they, they live with. But, you know, what I did think was, you know, I, with of one fifth of my generation born in the 70s, not having children, you know, and I, I wondered if, you know, this was to do with the fact that part of not wanting to have to do that is not wanting the drudgery, the unpaid work and the really, really hard work of having a children. And as you, as you put it, you know, looking at it and thinking, well, having it all, as we were told, means doing it all, perhaps isn't all that appealing to everyone. Yeah, I think there's a real difference when I talk between, because I'm 36 now and I don't have kids, when I'm between I'm talking to friends who've, you know, who've got them, I'm, I'm talking about straight couples here, that I think the men are much more prone to romanticize what it means to have kids. And actually the women are more, you know, privately a lot more hard headed about the fact that, yeah, it's brilliant. And I absolutely love my children, but God, I'm tired, you know, particularly in the last couple of months, you know, I, you know, and I interviewed the parenting expert, Emily Oster for a radio four series I do called the spark. And she said something brilliant, which I thought was incredibly transgressive. She's an economist by training. So her big thing is data driven parenting, data driven said, parenting, data driven parenting. So she's the one who says basically, yeah, you can have a, you can have a glass of wine. It's going to be, you know, don't drink a liter of vodka, but like a glass of wine is not, you know, it's not going to ruin your. Oh, she analyzes all the data to make sure that you've got the information. Yeah, right. So she's reviewed. So the book is called Expecting Better. But she said about having kids, she said, you know, it's it's marginal utility. I think I'm using the right economic term there. If I only had one hour a day, I would spend it with my children. That's the one thing I would love to do in every day. But actually, eight hours a day with them is too much. 
and like and, and you and, and you you kind of instinctively get that right like watching frozen brilliant watching frozen three times back to back it begins if you're an adult to probably lose a little bit of its luster but i think that still feels like quite a taboo thing to say and actually in the early days of that lockdown period where after i'd written that piece i had a lot of people saying oh wouldn't it be like why wouldn't women want to spend more time with their kids you know who doesn't what kind of monster doesn't want to spend more time with their kids and actually the answer to that is most people really love their children but they also love being an adult and having conversations and following their own interests and then being one part of their life and actually the really interesting thing when you look at the research is that you know college educated couples intensively parent now in a way they didn't in the 50s when you know college educated men were at work so there has been this cult of the the mum, the super super sacrificial mum, at exactly the same time that women have gone to the workplace. And you think, well, that's it, isn't it? It's about making women feel guilty that they can't be perfect, that they can't do it all, they can't have it all. Yeah, <laughs> it looks like it. Um, yeah, so much to think about. Um, it's not, and the yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm just I'm just thinking that just thinking that through. It's just so it's so true and so revolutionary. Um, and when it comes to it comes when it, and it's not just the it's not just the spending time with children. It's the way it leaks into relaxing. You know, there are mm. such gendered expectations around. We did a session on um, on rest with Claudia um, Hammond a few weeks ago, and you know, it just seems to be there's this really gendered attitude around free time. You know, as if you know, if it, it, women should are meant to feel very guilty about um, enjoying their free time. One of the most radical things I, I, I read it a while back when I was reviewing her book. Bridget Schulter, the author of a book called Overwhelmed, uh, looked at this, um, and she had a thing that just blew my mind when I read it, which was the idea that throughout you know the 20th century, the role of women was to protect unblo unbroken blocks of men's uninterrupted time. So that was either the good wife did that for you or the good secretary did that if you had a job with sufficient status. And I thought that's, uh, and actually the really interesting thing, there's been re coronavirus research that has talked about the amount of time that parents have had to do their day jobs uninterrupted. And, and, and it's, men are getting three times as much uninterrupted time as women when they've got, when they've got you know, two parent households with children. And that's the that's the, the stuff that again gets into the nitty gritty that I find fascinating, because you can't write a symphony or a novel or be a CEO around other things, and while your while your one eye is constantly on something else, and that's one of the things that's that's holding women back from those exceptionally high achievement jobs. I think is the idea that you can't ever that no one's no one's there to guard your time for you. You don't deserve to have this pristine block of time that is your you know deep thought time. Um, and I think that's really true. And the other thing uh, is, you know, about the idea about mental load, about kind of women as the project managers of a household. I think is when you, when you hear that analysis, I think a lot of people they suddenly click and it goes, right. The kind of the paradigm of the male partner who goes, oh, I would have cleared up if you'd only told me what to do. And it, it positions, you know, them you, you, the female partner as the sort of project manager of the household, constantly sit, like looking what's to be done, what's to be done, how, you know, do and, and having that ticking over. Um, and, and that's that in itself is a, is a mentally draining thing to do. And Ali Hoshchow found this in her research that it was women who thought about whether or not the school trip was coming up, thought about what the, uh, the Halloween costume needed to be, thought about whether or not you know were on the phone doing the doctor's appointment while trying to do their other work. They ended up doing the sort of supervisory parenting, which is a different thing again to just physically being there. Yeah, so it was a really yeah a really excellent um point this idea that the mental load of managing all the things has to be done mainly falls to the women it's really interesting and the only practical piece of advice i can offer to anyone is just never iron anything that was a pledge i made Solid. in my 20s and never ask anyone else to iron and just get it out of your life <laughs> a little bit of time back um if if um we, we talked about selma jones as a difficult woman but um but one of the women I really wanted to talk to you about, because I think she's someone who's been not just sort of marginalised um, out of the story, but really been taken out of her own story, um, is Erin Prizzy? Pitsy. Erin yeah. Pitsy, yes. And, and she was um, the uh, founder of uh, the kind of women's refuge movement. Or she certainly set up the first uh, women's refuge. And yet now she's a... Uh, no longer really uh, connected to that story. I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the, the women's refuges, um, refuges, how they were set up, how she did it. 
Yeah, well, she's not just um, not connected to that story. She's she's gone to the uh, polar opposite extreme. She's a men's rights activist. You know, she says feminism has destroyed the nuclear family, um, and you know, she's an uh, an editor at large for a site where the you know the guy who runs it said he would never convict in a rape trial because uh, the, the court system has been so corrupted by you know this myth of rape culture. Um, so she's really, you know, she's crossed the, the Rubicon out of feminism and into something else very definitely. But it's really but interesting they, to find out how, why she's done that. The story from where she started and how she got there is is really worth going into, I think. Well, I found it quite a resonant story because I sort of felt, I, I have definitely felt the, the pitsy temptation myself. So what happens is she founds this women's refuge in 1971 in Chiswick. She gets a, a house from the council and um, and essentially sort of squats it, um, uh, and which was very much what happened in the early years of the refuge movement, right? It was very do-it-yourself. It was very volunteer-led. It didn't have the kind of professionalism and money that it, that sector has today. Helen, and, you can, know, can you just explain what a women's refuge is? Just so Yeah, of course. So their idea was that if you were what they would have t- at the time were called a battered wife, that you would have somewhere that you could escape to and go. And, you know, she, uh, her, her refuges were run like kind of communes, essentially. You could be voted in and voted out if you behaved badly. She, had, she always made a point she had men working in the refuge. The addresses weren't hidden in the way that they are today. It was a much more, it was quite an anarchic thing. But she, you know, she, she let people come back as many times as they needed to. She was happy them staying for a really long time. She wanted to do deep therapeutic work with people but she ran into this issue that everybody who works in domestic violence will tell you about is really hard to deal with which is the women go back and you know and the same thing happens to male victims both in same-sex relationships and with female perpetrators people who are in those kind of relationships the reason that they are so difficult to break is not because they're a constant parade of misery usually it's about the fact that they are abuse mixed with someone saying I'm the only one who loves you, you know, you, you'll, you'll be nothing without me, you know, and, and people isolating people from their friends, maybe controlling their social life, you know, checking their phone constantly. All of those things, those, those behaviours, you know, make it very difficult, that, that make it very different to an assault in the, in the street. So she, you know, politically came up with this theory that there wasn't such a thing as, as male violence. Actually, it was really about dysfunctional couples. And what, you know, well, I've just been working on a piece about domestic violence now. People say the thing that people now look at, they have the idea of coercive control, right? The idea that perpetrators control their victims. And, and, they, and then that feels like love to people. But also the fact that male and female violence just are different. It is just much, much easier for a man to kill a woman with his bare hands than the other way around. Men are on average bigger and stronger. So we have to treat men's violence differently. Um, so there was that political disagreement with the, with the women's movement. And then there was the personal disagreement. This is the bit I'm kind of more sympathetic to, which is that she just found, she sort of saw herself as an ordinary housewife. And she sort of found the women's movement was full of people who were obsessed with kind of purity and had, you know, were Stalinists and Maoists, um, you know, were revolutionaries. What do you and mean? Just, what do you mean purity? Well, in the sense that, so there was a big... Um, Thing in the 70s of radical lesbian separatism, right? The idea that you were a traitor. And, you know, and this is a small part of 70s feminism, but there were people who thought if you slept with men, that was, you know, you were literally sleeping with the enemy and that a good feminist ought to, to renounce men. And, you know, quite a lot of people went, well, I, I, quite, like, I quite like men. Um, sorry, I'm not sure I can actually choose my sexuality like that. So she, she, you know, she felt that they were kind of purity obsessed. And she had grown up in, in China, pre-communist China, she was born. So she wasn't enthused by people who were big fans of Chairman Mao, uh, un, not unsurprisingly. And, you know, and, and then and the far left elements who were, who were, you know, thought that Stalin had some good ideas, you know, when millions of people died under that regime. So, you know, it was about her self-perception as a, as a normal woman versus these ideology-obsessed feminists. And I think it's something that if you spend a lot of time in feminism, you have to kind of reckon with that there will always be somebody who doesn't think you're a good enough feminist. And how do you react to that? And, you know, to me, the the answer to that is it doesn't, this isn't a kind of social club where you want to get on with people. It's a political project where you have certain goals and aims in common. And that's what binds you together rather than the idea that you, you know, you get on with or you have a huge amount personally in common with other people in the feminist movement. Yeah, I think you say that towards the end. You say, you know, feminism isn't about fun, it's about equality. (laughs) I really loved it. 
Um, Sorry. <laughs> but no, absolutely. But with Erin, you know, and I, and I, you know, you go into detail with the with um, with the legality of it. But you know, this is very early in the time of it actually being illegal to um, to uh, assault your yeah. uh, your um, spouse. And you know, Erin set up the first refuge that as they were called then, battered women could go to, to to escape where they could start their life, take their children and start their life again. And you, you know, you've explained a little bit about, you know, um, about her difficulties with the feminist movement and how she uh, began to sort of move away from kind of the feminist movement and why she couldn't share their ideology because, she, you know, she was from China. But... Uh, or because she's from China, she understood what that, that really meant in practice. But, you know, why why isn't she a feminist hero? She's still... Yeah, well, why? this is the thing that I I struggle with. You know, I um I sent her a, she she emailed me actually, and about when the review of the book came out, she I, I suspect quite strongly she's got a Google alerts out for her name, um, and I which I think again is really interesting that she you know for all her bravado I think probably feels that she hasn't got the credit that she's due. You know, Refuge is the successor organisation to the one she founded, and she's not on the website anywhere on the on the in the history page. I don't like from their corporate point of view from theirs, I understand it. But I did think this was a really interesting way to talk about one of the fundamental things that we have to grapple with, which is she did something brilliant, but she believes things that you know, are fundamentally at odds with the rest of the movement. And how do you how do you write that history? How do you deal with that? You know, I don't no one's gonna be campaigning for a statue of Aaron Pitsy to be put up, but there equally are women alive today because of what she did, you know, probably in Britain, thousands of women alive today, but not just because of her refuge, because of the ones that she inspired. And that's, you know, that's a, for somebody who wants to be on the right side of everything, that's quite a difficult thing to confront. How do you feel about that? What does that, you know, do you approve of her? Do you feel that she should be celebrated? Do you, you know, how do you write that history? And, you know, as you say, she's, she's not on the website of, you know, these refuges she set up. That is, you know, airbrushing someone out of the history they created. Again, it's very topical for now. Um, but, you know, she went to work for the for men's rights associations who and just to make that absolutely clear, this is an organisation who believe their ideals are absolutely incompatible with feminism. Um, how, but you went further than that. You went to talk to her. Uh, you yeah. know, you, you, you reached out to her and you went and found her. She lives in Chiswick, I think, now or somewhere. She lives in Twickenham, yeah. She lives in Twickenham. So you spoke to her. What did she tell you? What did you find out? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I emailed her through um, Honest Ribbon, her site that supports that will tell you the truth about domestic violence statistics. And, you know, I th and she was very nice to me. She was very pleasant to me. She invited me to her flat, you know, um, Got me a went and got me a glass of water, you know, all those kind of pleasantries. And I think that she's that's one of the reasons that she intrigues me is that she's not kind of crabby and guarded and and hostile to the feminist movement. I think she's got a really ambiguous relationship with it, um, and and, that, and I find that much more interesting than I do straightforward celebration. You know, somebody who's just straight up and and damn good. And you know, I sent her a, a copy of the book, and I wrote in the inside, you know, to Erin, who deserves her place in history, because to me, that's what writing a history does. You know, it's not about kind of like thumbs up, thumbs down. It's about this is how it happened, and this is you know, this is what the preconditions are to, in order to achieve change. You know, what are you willing to do in order to get the things that you want? Is always the the question that anyone who wants to change society needs to ask themselves. You know, what are your limits really? Who will you tolerate in a movement with you? Um, you know, when does compromise become capitulation? And I and I think that, you know, you, these are questions about feminism, but they're also questions that are extremely relevant to the political movements that we're seeing now, right? You know, what, how do you have an organisation with no clear hierarchy? How do you stop other people speaking for you? How do you stop, you know, the cause being derailed into kind of petty, small issues? And, and how do you keep the focus on the things that really matter? And, and those things are as relevant now as I think they were in the 1970s. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're going to have to say we are already um, out of <laughs> out of time, Helen. We've barely scratched the surface. Uh, we're going to take we're going to take a very quick um, break now. And then we're going to come back to Helen. I've still got a couple of, um, of other questions to ask her. Um, but do please um, get a cup of tea or a glass of wine or uh, something that you'd like to um, to enjoy your Sunday evening. Um, and do put any questions that you have uh, in the comments field, and I will put them to Helen in a moment. Thank you. <laughs> 
Hello, hello and welcome back. Um, and thank you um, for being with us for Book Club Live. Thank you, Helen, for a very fast-paced, fascinating and um, first half of Book Club Live. I'd just like to say hello to a couple of members I know who are um, out there today. Um, hello to Anne W, to Jill M, to Tracy M, to uh, Helen G, to Susie C, to Sam A and Sylvia B. Hello and welcome. I know you're with me tonight because uh, Charlotte told me, so I just wanted to say hello. And thanks to Charlotte for doing all, all of the organisation tonight. Um, so we have a question from uh, Polly, uh, Helen, and she says, hello, Helen and Helen. Wow, thanks for saying it how it is. Um, and she said her question is, uh, Helen, when you fight a war on one main front, it's pretty easy to see the enemy and fight it. But when you're fighting on a million tiny fronts, those prison cell bars, as you put it, um, how do we achieve those step changes? Is there anything your difficult women have in common in the way they thought besides being difficult? Is it about collaboration, as you alluded to? That's a really good question. And it's kind of the fundamental theme that underlies the book is how do you make change happen because it's the most interesting political question you know what works right how, how do you get from a situation where in 1870 you know you can't you're only just been allowed to own property to getting the vote to getting equal pay to getting the sex discrimination act um and my my answer to it at the end which i outline kind of more fully in the conclusion is about structures it's all about focusing on structures cultural change is brilliant and like feels wonderful because what do you it feels mean like by suddenly, cultural change well, I think what you've seen in the last, uh, you know, couple of weeks in the um, in the US and now here in Black Lives Matter protests, you know, the idea that people are finally having a reckoning with structural racism, the way that it's woven so deeply into our society, can feel incredibly cathartic, and it can feel that things are changing. You know, New York is already reviewing its funding of police, for example. You know, things like big, big, big things can happen um, like that. But there's um, there's a great phrase about politics, which is that is the slow boring of hard boards. And I think that's generally more often the, the way that it works. And, you know, what you need to do really is have a kind of, you know, what do we want? Who, you know, the, it's a version of Tony Benn's Five Questions for Power, which is basically like, what do we want? Who can give it to us? What's standing in our way? Um, and, and I think when you look back at the second wave of feminism in the 1970s, it was it feels now like a, such an extraordinarily revolutionary, successful time. And one of the reasons for that is that they focus so heavily on both legal changes and economic changes. So, for example, making sure that child benefit went not, you know, wasn't did taken into a pay packet, which would have usually meant it went to the man. It went to the, the, at the time, mother, we'd now say primary caregiver. You know, and that was a much more bureaucratic way of doing it, but it gave women a huge amount of independence. You know, it, it was a little bit like wages for housework. You know, it was a little bit of money that you had just, just for you, that you didn't have to rely on your partner giving to you. That kind of thing is really important. Um, the modern example for that, for me, would be universal credit, which is going to have been claimed by a huge, huge number of people the first time because of the unemployment spiking during um, the recession that's, that's coming. And that goes to the household. And, you know, there were Commons Committee hearings all the way through when this was being developed saying that is, you know, that reverses 50 years of welfare policy about the idea that you don't let men control women's money. That is a, just, a, you know, that people don't like it and it's a recipe for putting power into the hands of controlling men um and that wasn't listened to and that that is the kind of thing that you know just you have to keep fighting that that economic battle like that um and the same thing with with law you know um Stella Creasy at the moment is fighting for the idea that misogyny would become a hate crime in the same way that homophobia or racism you know can be used to modify sentences and you have to think that the reason that's been resisted for so long is that there's so much misogyny around. And actually, it always devolved into a conversation about, well, what about catcalling? And you know, I don't think catcalling should be made illegal, but it's quite um, it's quite interesting to me that people, is it argument essentially against that law is, but there's so much misogyny about how could we possibly get the police involved in it, which is something that ought to really kind of give you pause to reflect. So the one thing I would say that all of my women, and this is the bias and how I chose them, you know, one of the things they did is they changed something they had a, an achievement you could kind of hang your hat on, essentially, whether it be in the case of Mary Stopes about, you know, publicizing access to contraceptives, you know, getting that word out there, getting mother's clinics established, or like Erin Pitsy we talked about with domestic violence shelters, um, you know, just something concrete like that is always what you should be aiming for, in my opinion.
Okay, thank you. Brilliant answer. And thank you so much, Polly. Thank you so much, Polly. Hope you're well. Um, Ashley, you were saying, I'm really glad to hear you say, you know, that the, the, the um, second wave of feminism in the 70s is such an incredibly um, productive and important time. Because one of the questions from uh, Mia is, you know, are we in danger of sweep sweeping away um, the second wave of feminism and its achievements um, um, for being privileged and blinkered? Yeah, I mean, I, you don't start me on this one, but I've got a copy of somewhere of my uh, Women's Rights, A Practical Guide, which was written by two feminist campaigners. Um, and, you know, they said to, I talked to uh, one of the people who wrote it, he said we had to, you know, there was so much change between 72 and 74 that we had to do an updated edition. But you read it and it's about what are your rights about, you know, visiting your partner in prison? What are your rights about, uh, you know, enforcing, uh, you know, how do you split up a council tenancy if you divorce, you know, all of this kind of stuff that is not about, you know, middle class ladies with nothing else to complain about. Um, just getting, you know, do, sort of you know, in between their maid coming around, having some thoughts about sexism. The, the second wave did an enormous amount of, you know, I'm sure it could have been better in terms of its class diversity, its race diversity and other axis of oppression, but it wasn't the way that it's now often portrayed as being this incredibly elite exclusive club at all. You know, there was a huge amount of black women's activism during the 1970s, you know, which is a really important part of the story. And actually, if you are if you think that it is very privileged, it sort of means that the history writing process has, as ever, privileged the privileged. Uh, and actually that perhaps, you know, there there is stuff about what went on that you maybe don't know about. You know, the Sex Discrimination Act applied to, made all women's lives better. You know, the Equal Pay Act was particularly important for, for working women. You know, those Dagenham machinists. You know, these are not, you know, um, ladies who lunch. They were women in working class jobs who wanted just to be paid, you know, equivalent wages to men. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mia. That's a great question. Um, I've got a question from Rachel C here. It says, um, how how do you how do you argue how do you argue with um, people who say that their personal experience is more important than all the evidence to the contrary? <laughs> uh, I, I tried to avoid it if at all possible <laughs> because <very> good advice. <laughs> because how can you do that? The, the difficulty is with it, and I and this is a really interesting um, the way this plays out is obviously you have to listen to people's personal experience. Um, you know, they have a right to it. They have a right to articulate it. They might know things that you don't because it's their everyday life. You know, for example, I just don't know what it's like to be a young black man walking down the street in Britain, given the state of things like stop and search and, the, and that kind of legacy of suspicion that comes around, you know, on, on those people. Ditto, you know, uh, there are men in my life who say until the Everyday Sexism Project was launched about 10 years ago, where people would just talk, you know, about the small incidences of things that happened to them, like catcalling, they had absolutely no idea this stuff was happening. If it's not, you know, it's very hard to see what you're not seeing. So it's really, really important that people do talk about their, their personal experience. But again, it comes back to structures. Ultimately, there are things that you, you only know but they are also provable, right? So I can say I know this about, you know, for example, about hiring bias. You Maybe I feel that I haven't been hired because I'm a woman. Well, you can design an experiment to prove that that is empirically true as well. And that's, you know, feminism shouldn't shy away from that. I believe that everything, all my feminist arguments are not grounded purely in feelings. You know, that kind of, that, that, there's a right-wing American called Ben Shapiro who always goes, facts don't care about your feelings which is supposed to be this kind of amazing put down of, uh, you know, social justice warriors. But feminism is incredibly well supported by evidence. You know, we have just some of the smartest social scientists and economists have just found this stuff out and is, you know, it is just proved beyond all doubt. For example, you know, in the developing world, giving micropayments and loans directly to women has much better poverty allevi alleviating effects than it does giving that, those, that money to men because the women spend it on families, they spend it on keeping children healthy, you know, um, you know, that it's, it's proved, it's just, it's, it's, you know, you can design an experiment to prove it. So I don't think we should be afraid of personal experience because it, personal experience, lots and lots and lots of personal experiences can be evaluated as evidence. Oh, thank you. Um, we've got a question here. It's a, a, a private question, um, but it relates to the, a couple of the things that we've just been talking about. Um, and this person says that they've been thinking a lot about um, some of the TV programs that have been pulled because of uh, blacked up characters and saying it's really interesting that, you know, 
uh, so many programs have, have not been pulled that show you know they have incredible visceral um misogyny in them and um she she wanted to ask your opinion on the fact that it's interesting the dialogue is always is about race and class at the moment and not about uh, misogyny um because she thinks it's uh, fascinating how much it's entirely overlooked when we're um, looking at culture. I wondered if she wanted to know what your opinions were on that. I th yeah, I think it's really interesting. There's a great book by um, Andrew Solomon called Far From the Tree, in which he talks to uh, parents of children who have identities that aren't like them, what he calls the difference between horizontal identities, where you know your whole family's got it, versus vertical identities. So parents of children with autism or deaf children, um, he talks to mothers of um who've been raped during genocide in rwanda you know have, have children with their their rapists and one of the things that that brings it home to you is that women's organizing can never be horizontal like that you know and unless you're going to be a lesbian separatist which it turned out most people really weren't into even most lesbians weren't into you know women are always going to live with men you know they're going to give birth to men they're going to have friendships with men you know their, their loyalty will you know there's always a stat about you know white women voting for donald trump well why, if you're a white woman living in a conservative religious part of America, would you feel more affinity with Hillary Clinton than you would with the vote of your own husband? Um, so that is one of the great things that inhibits, to my mind, the discussion of misogyny is that, you know, if you do it, you risk pissing off a lot of men that you care about because they feel and they see it as an attack on, on them. So that's tough. And as I say, you know, the, the, uh, the way that women are sort of told to be, you know, sugar and spice and all things nice. And you, know, you should grow up to be a, a princess. Well, what do princesses do? They, they wear frocks and they get married. That's kind of, you know, until the last five years and frozen, that's kind of all that they, they did. And, and that inhibits women's activism as well. The idea that you should be kind of, should be selfless. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons that we don't get that conversation. But, you know, it, it has changed. I grew up in the 90s when ironic sexism was the thing, you know, and it was all about like, well, if you're cool and, you know, not uptight, then obviously you'd want to be an FHM. But though all those magazines have, have, have gone, uh, but, you know, unfortunately, I imagine they've really been replaced by porn aggregator sites, which don't necessarily show any more of a respectful attitude towards women. But, you know, things do do change and attitudes do change and how people feel. I mean, my, my, my feeling about always about these things is, there's obviously a hard line of stuff that you just, even contextually, you would never show anymore. There's simply, you know, there's no, BBC One is not going to broadcast the triumph of the will at this point, or, you know, um, which is Nazi propaganda. But I would, what I would more like is about bringing context to stuff. You know, um, I think the idea about the statues, excuse me, the idea about the statues about taking them down, but not to destroy them, but to put them in a museum of slavery, a museum of empire. You know, to, to the idea that history is one layer on top of another, and you can keep you it is always a commentary on the on the strata that came before it and and that to me is a, is a more healthy way of looking at it and it's really interesting we did a session um last year at the festival with uh, margaret mcmillan the historian and mm. and it was about the uses for history and and she said one thing that was absolutely brilliantly memorable is like you know history is absolutely brilliant particularly recent history because <laughs> you, you know you really can learn a huge amount by looking at recent history and actually i wanted to uh, ask about um a couple of other of your, your difficult women um and talking about recent history i put into a search engine a couple of search engines today who was the first openly gay mp and the answer i got every time is um chris smith is that right no it's not right and it annoys the piss out of me <laughs> um so chris smith was a, a is a man it was a new labor um minister uh, and he came out voluntarily so that's the distinction he's the first um minister to come out mp to come out voluntarily but actually a whole decade before that there was a woman mp called maureen calhoun who are, i write about in the book she arrived in the Commons at the age of 45 in February 1974 uh, to find what she called a maleocracy. And she was one of only, you know, out of 600 and then there were 30-ish MPs, there were only 27 women. So they had the lady members room that they all used to kind of go and hang out and do their ironing. I'm afraid this was an era in which there was a lot of things needed ironing. Um, and, you know, and she worked on a bill called the Balance of the Sexes Bill, which she said she had a modest proposal that, and this is 1976, 
that the House of Lords should be 50% women, given that the population was 50% women, and that all, uh, you know, quangos, all these government things like the Milk Marketing Board and the Covent Garden Authority and the rail, you know, given that it was the 70s and everything was controlled by the state, they should all have quotas on their boards. They should be 50% women because women were, you know, she, and, and she made a speech in which she said, well, you know, would the Honourable gentle on the other side, not admit that the world has been run by men for a long time and it couldn't really be in a worse state. So let, why not let us have a go? But in the course of doing that, there was a young res uh, researcher she fell in love with called Babs Todd uh, and she left her husband for him. They moved in together and they were outed by Nigel Dempster of the Daily Mail and went through a pretty torrid time. Um, but she was always open about it. She had Babs listed as her partner in her who's who entry. Um, but it really contributed to her being deselected, which she then appealed and then contested the 1979 election. But she she lost her seat to a conservative. So it was this great irony that Margaret Thatcher won the 79 election, Britain's first woman prime minister, but the number of female MPs in the House dropped by 12 in that same election. Um, so there were fewer women in the House than ever before. Uh, and, and Maureen tried to get a seat several times afterwards but she was finished she worked for a single parent charity and then she retired to the to the lake district and you know was pretty much forgotten as, as far as i could see and that's the real sadness her whole story has really been forgotten and you know it's talking about nigel dempster you know and his expose of her um you know the reason the reason that that came out as i understand it was that someone was being blackmailed because if they that they wouldn't get a visa to America on the grounds of being a lesbian, which was seen as deviancy in the mid-70s. Yeah. I found and, that and that's so one shocking. Of things, immigration rules are a really fascinating um, like way of looking at how a society feels about itself. So, yeah, America at the time, you could be refused a visa on grounds of deviancy, and that's what they threatened one of these women that attended their housewarming with, with outing her. But, you know, the same thing happened when I went to the abortion chapter to to talk to three women in Northern Ireland in Derry about why they had bought uh, the morning after pill on the internet and then handed themselves into a conservatory. And they were all, you know, in their 60s. And they said one of the reasons that they did it, they said, well, we wanted to show solidarity with women of childbearing age for a start. And the second thing is, it, under until they've changed the law, an abortion, if you don't get two doctors to sign it off, it can be prosecuted. And the, the, the offence that they prosecute you for is assault. It's under the Offences Against the Person Act, which is from the 1800s. So you have technically assaulted the fetus. And that's a violence conviction. So that means uh, it shows up on a disclosure and barring check if you want to work with children or vulnerable adults. And also, if you want to get a visa to go to America or Australia, you, wouldn't, you probably wouldn't be able to, to do that with that conviction, or it would at least be very hard. So they said it's not fair for young women who've got their whole lives ahead of them to face all those administrative barriers. Like, you know, we'll, we'll take that, that hit. And, you know, there was another story that didn't make it into the book, but in the 1970s, Asian women coming to Britain to marry um, into Asian British families was su subject to virginity checks. Say uh, again? Uh, yeah, they were subjected to, to check that they were still virgins, That they, which I don't really see why it was any of the business of the British state, whether or not you, you, know, you wanted to marry someone who's virgin. But that was considered to be a test of whether or not they were legitimately here to get married or whether or not they were going to disappear off into the grey economy. So the British state was was examining women's vaginas to see whether or not they were allowed a, a visa or not. It's just, I mean, this is, you know, and, and, and you see the legacy of that today and no recourse to public funds, right? There is a visa condition for people to come here that says you can come and work here, but if you fall on hard times, you don't have any recourse to the state. And that's a really big problem for um, women from immigrant communities who need to, say, access domestic violence shelters because it's really, really hard for them to get a place because most of the funding for that comes from local authorities. So immigration rules are, are, are routinely have, have been throughout, you know, from the 70s till now, used to screw over women, particularly minority women. And it's just, it's, it's one of those things that never quite tips over into people's consciousness. Yeah, and it, it's the kind of thing that you, um, is very often pointed out in other, in other countries, in other regimes, right. it's really difficult to accept that it's part of our heritage. Again, so topical. You know, you write so beautifully about um, the uh, change in the abortion law in Ireland. And um, again, it really reminded me of um, a, a peace campaigner we work with, uh, Dr. Cilla Elworthy, who's been um, three times nominated for the Nobel Prize for Peace. And she said, you know, one of the great untapped powers in the world for change is postmenopausal women. Hmm. 
It's true. They don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> One of my friends has said that. She said it was really fascinating when she went through the menopause and whatever the hormones are that kind of ever weigh. And she said, you know, my, my children ask me like where their keys are and I just don't, I don't care anymore. I just don't like, you don't get that kind of immediate surge of kind of, you know, uh, and I just thought, well, that's true, isn't it? Like all of the things we have about witches and crones are probably all date from the fact that that was a group of women who essentially couldn't really be bullied anymore, didn't really care what you thought of them. Yeah, yeah, and are prepared, you know, the, 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 and you just feel that absolute, you know, if we go to prison, we go to prison. We are doing everything we can to, to change this law in Ireland and over, overthrow the power of, the, of, um, of religion over women's bodies. And we are, you know, literally do or die. And it's so beautifully written. Yeah, I loved, I loved reporting that chapter. And I loved meeting, meeting my three women. They were great. And, and that, was a, that was a lovely chapter to write because actually even by the time the book had gone to press, it was obsolete. Um, and the, you know, the reform came through saying, you know, if Stormont hasn't reconvened the Northern Irish Assembly, then, we, you know, this will be allowed to, to lapse and an abortion will essentially be legalised. And that's exactly what happened. Now, there's still big problems with, uh, with doctors refusing to carry out abortions, but that spectre, so the access is still an issue, but that spectre of an assault conviction you know, and, and people being harassed. That was a lot of what was happening before my three lovely women stepped up was that, you know, the, the Garda would kind of go round or the PSNI would kind of go round and, and, and you know, fish things out of bins or people's housemates would dob them in. You know, extraordinary stuff like that happening. Mm. And, and just to finish off on, um, on uh, Maureen, um, Maureen uh, Cole Coon, isn't it? Maureen. Yes. Um, there was a there was a kind of you know she was so written out of that story of being um, the first gay MP, but there was you know again you do involve yourself in the story you know you you go and and you speak to her and you know there it, it, it in the end it, it her contribution was recognised. Well, I had a lovely postscript to what happened with the book, which is that um, so I know Kezia Dugdale who was the Labour Party leader in Scotland. Um, I think about 2014 to 2017, something like that. She now works at the John Smith um, Institute as a, an academic. And she's gay. And she came out during her time as, as Labour leader when she was in, you know, quite later on in her life. Um, and, you know, that was a really interesting experience. It was something that she was quite nervous about. She hadn't done it, uh, you know, early in her time in public life. And the, 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 there are two lovely things about this. The first is that, as she said herself later, there was actually more interest in the fact that the woman she's dating, Jenny, is a MSP for the Scottish National Party and she's in the Labour Party. That was far more shocking to people than the idea that a woman is allowed to date a woman. Like, this is where we've got to now in politics, <laughs> which is, yeah, yeah, I guess it has some downsides too. But the second thing is that she hadn't known the story of, of Maureen either. Um, and so she asked me to put her in touch with Maureen's family, which I did. Uh, and they're now pen pals. So Maureen's coming up and she'll be 92 in August. So yeah, um, so Kezia has been writing to her in her from from Edinburgh to Keswick in the Lake District, which is I think a lovely a lovely connection between a, a, a two pioneering lesbians in the Labour Party. <laughs> nice work, Helen. Um, we've got a question for for Steph, and I think this is kind of a question. Um, and there's been a couple of comments about this as well. This idea of sort of uh, almost woke washing. And it's sort of, you know, how do we deal uh, with companies that uh, promote gender diversity in their communications, in their advertising, you know, in their kind of big social media campaigns, but not actually within their companies? I think that's a massive issue now. I mean, I think that, and I think you've seen it in the last couple of weeks, just companies desperately realising that there's a kind of a reckoning has come and that they need to be seen to be on the train. And the point about that is what you need, again, is, is structures. You need specific commitments. So just before um, the lockdown, for example, the commitment on the gender pay gap reporting was dropped. It was said, oh, you know, business is having a really tough time, so this is the thing. Sorry, we're going to have to chuck this one overboard. And I really worry that's not going to come back. And the thing about that was that you know, this was a big, this was one of Harriet Harman's kind of long-running crusades. She finally got it through in 2010 as part of the Equality Act. The idea that you would have to, as a company, you know, uh, like let people know what you know wh whether or not they were all the women are mysteriously in the lower bands of salary and all the men are mysteriously in the top ones. Samira Ahmed's case with the BBC that was only possible because she found out her male comparators' data, uh, Jeremy Vine, and the Fawcett Society is running a campaign saying you should have access as a woman to be able to request your male comparators' data, and that's the thing that I think is the lesson that I would take out of the you know is words are extremely cheap. 
I went to Twitter. I write about this in the book. I don't think I mentioned that it's Twitter. No, but you just, don't. <laughs> but it is Twitter. <laughs> but, but now you can know that it's Twitter. <laughs> and they had signs on the toilet saying, you know, uh, self-identified females, gender diversity, welcome here. Fine. Great. But ha like, have you been on Twitter? Because it's not a particularly nice place to be as a, as a woman, particularly as an outspoken woman on politics. And it was one of those things where I thought, you know, cost of toilet sign, £3.50, cost of dealing with your misogyny problem on your platform rather more than that and that's what kind of that's why i talk about um yeah what people now call woke washing because actually show me what you've done and i think so much about this about politics now so much of politics seems to be about what what people have said what words they've used you know um have you had the right opinion on stuff ultimately less interesting than what have you done what will be different tomorrow for, for women, for black and minority ethnic people, because of things that you have changed, structures, processes, quotas, whatever it might have to be. Okay, thank you, Helen. Thank you, Steph. Um, so I, I kind of like want to um, end our book club live to talk about education because it's a kind of, it's it's a, you know, and it means we can end on, a, on an incredible high, really, because it's such a brilliant story that we were able to go for to to transform um women's access to education in a few generations um and i think you say yourself it's one of feminism's greatest successes and i wanted definitely to and one of the most satisfying things about it is that you know women weren't allowed to go to university in this country until 1870 i write about the edinburgh seven seven female medical students um, and all the arguments at the time were like, the thing is, women's brains are smaller, uh, and they can't they can't do it. They, it'll 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 befuddle them. And actually, we've gone to a situation now where the majority of um, medical undergraduates are, are women. Um, the majority of general pr practitioners uh, are, are women. So actually, like every time I now hear one of those arguments about the thing is, it's just biology, and women you know can't do it. Like they they hate maths, they hate whatever it is, STEM subjects. You kind of go, okay, but I'm. I'm just going to say that that is the kind of thing that people were saying about medicine 150 years ago. And it turned out women's brains could handle knowing about medicine. So you're going to have to show me some actual evidence rather than kind of relying on, on the way that things have always been. But to me, yeah, the interesting thing about education is it has now become such a focus in the developing world. I went to both Nepal and Uganda reporting about efforts there. It's phenomenally important. And it's if you want to support charities, literacy charities are really important because it's a way of helping people to be independent, have agency in their own lives. It's not, you know, it, it doesn't feel like top-down charity. And, and the more education that women get, the fewer children they have, the later they have them, the more ability they have to earn their own livings and therefore be, you know, independent themselves. And we've got a situation now in Britain where the, the group that everyone worries about is boys, particularly boys between the ages of about 11 and 16. And actually, you know, um, the, the kind of jobs that the, the men traditionally have are, are in decline. You know, manufacturing jobs are, are in decline. Um, so we've, we've actually, it's a, it's a story of almost sort of too much success for feminism in education. And actually now the, the pendulum kind of has to swing the other way and say, we're now designing schools around, you know, the good girl, the pupil who just sits down and is very quiet and doesn't kind of pipe up too much. And we have a problem with the way that we socialize boys you know, and, and when they're young, we let them off being boisterous and then suddenly they get a bit older and that's really, really frowned on and they're seen as being kind of tearaways and, and exclusions are much higher among, among boys. So it's one of those great, great success stories for feminism. And it kind of is about the fact that if you give women the tools to do stuff, they can, you know, sisters can do it for themselves, basically. And it's such a great success story, but in, not without its trials. And I think it's, you know, Sophia... Jex Blake, is it? Who yeah. was one of the Edinburgh Seven that you talk about that really forced her way into getting uh, a medical um, a medical degree? And it just, you know, it's very easy to, again to look back at history and think, oh, it was very, it was quite easy, but it was a huge fight. Um, and she only did it by being in incredibly determined and really bloody minded. And she pretty much failed as well. That's the other thing. I think a lot about the fact that um, in his doc, The Editor of Private Eye, was ed interviewed by Nick Robinson for his podcast and they asked who he admired. And he said, you know, those Victorian social reformers who worked on stuff, for example, like, you know, child labour in factories, and they were often doing it for decades. Um, sorry, I, I live next to a hospital. Um, and, you know, this is the other thing I think it's very easy to lose sight of now because there's a kind of telescoping effect of history. We assume that things that took you know, years or decades are, are kind of compressed because, you know, 
the difference between 1880 and 1890 now doesn't seem that that massive to us but you know living through it it, it obviously was so Sophia Jokes Blake yeah asked to be you know she got admitted to Edinburgh um she was doing very very well uh and and then the, the and, and that was the problem when when the when the female students started doing really well the the, the trouble really began and and the university eventually kicked them out um and she had to go and qualify abroad and then and then come back and then she went and worked for a women's hospital but i found that that was such an important story because my friend caroline criado perez was in the middle of writing her book invisible women um which is all about the gender data gap and having women involved in medicine was so important to beginning to fill in those those gaps and the way that then things that weren't you know attention wasn't paid to the differences between women's and men's bodies and and the foundation and you know, that generation of female doctors that founded women's clinics that founded mothers clinics was so unbelievably important when mary stopes who i also write about in the book founded you know contraceptive clinics she said instead of going to see a male doctor you should go and see a female nurse as your first point of contact and that's something that's still really important now you know there are still people really i think value having you know when they're doing obstetric and gynecology they really value having women in the in the room and women and, and it not being you know that 50s sort of experience of, of childbirth where it was one woman and you know seven male doctors and um, that's just been so important yeah but even so you know nothing is nothing is is that a simpler story you know she was problematic she was a difficult a difficult woman you know she everyone is problematic yeah <laughs> she was very, 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 she was very very snobby and uh you know there was a massive riot called the surgeons hall riot where they were all the female students were trying to study for their exams and someone shoved a sheep into the the um the anatomy department's pet sheep which slightly i suspect that sheep might not have had a long to live which is a bit sad poor maley it was called and they shoved a sheep into the classroom when they were trying to learn and and you know it and, and that is something that happened to a lot of these early women in universities is there were kind of big demonstrations about them. Uh, you know, and, and with the kind of anger, the way that Sophia Jex Blake describes it, that reminds me of, you know, if you study the history of the civil rights movement, about efforts to desegregate schools in the American South in the 50s and 60s. And exactly the same process was happening there, which was the status quo was being threatened. You know, people's privilege and, and the way that they got a lock on knowledge was being threatened. Um, by letting women into university. So I imagine that the anger that they faced was extraordinary and visceral and designed to kind of drain them and put them off and, and not be able to do the things they wanted to do. Nice. But yeah, as you say, she said, you know, I would have expected better from, you know, from these middle class boys, you know, that not they weren't kind of like hoodlums. And just very casually, the kind of attitudes of a middle class, you know, late Victorian, that there were sort of working people were kind of, you know, dirty and feckless and drunk and not respectable. And it was very much of her time. Yeah, very much of her time. And again, you know, but important to remember, you know, the whole reason for writing this book. And, you know, although it's a great success story, and as you say, there are a lot more women um, qualifying as doctors now than there are um, uh, men coming out of the universities. But it's, you know, not all, you know, it's not all like that. You know, surgeons, not yeah. so much. And then we're back to kind of where we started in terms of why aren't there more female surgeons? Yeah, so only 10% of surgeons are women. And a lot of that is about uh, it being a very kind of macho discipline and kind of having this idea of the heroic surgeon, which actually, you know, lots of people who do research into surgery say is not the way to approach it. Um, there's a brilliant group called the Clinical Human Factors Group, which essentially has tried to apply the lessons of aeroplane disasters to surgery. And one of the big problems that was causing lots and lots of plane crashes was a culture of over-deference. You know, the idea that the pilot must know what he's doing uh, and, you know, or well, he must know that we're running out of fuel as we're trying to circle and thing, and that no one could kind of pipe up and say that to him. And actually the studies found exactly the same thing happened, particularly because you had male surgeons and female nurses, but the nurses didn't feel empowered to say, while you're trying to, you know, intubate this person, actually they're going blue and shouldn't you just do a tracheostomy and cut into their throat, for example. And the fact that the way that gender dynamics and power dynamics were encouraging that that kind of idea of a man at the top who couldn't be questioned and that was leading to worse outcomes for patients and, and it's one of the really big reasons that you would want to have gender equality is to break down those kind of men at the top women at the bottom hierarchies that actually don't benefit the people at the, on the other side of them
Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so glad we got to talk about education. You know, I think one of the big themes of Salon and the work that we do is it's really, really important, the stories that we see uh, and, you know, the, the people that we read about because they do become part of us and how we see the world and how we operate in it. So I think we have to accept, uh, Helen, that everyone is problematic and you have to kind of embrace the difficulty. Is that right? You have to embrace the difficulty within what it is to be human and try and channel it into making change. Totally. I mean, that's, you can't do politics without people and people are incredibly complicated and often do things that don't really make sense. But, you know, that's the that's the wonder and the challenge of it, I think. And if we're waiting for the sort of perfect person to solve the problem, it's just not going to happen. And no, when we look at them in history, they're not there. Yeah. Yeah, completely. So um, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Helen. This is, uh, this is Helen's book, uh, Difficult Women. I know some of you have bought it already. Uh, I think some of you have it and it's on the way to some of you. And if you'd like to get it from us, we are a, a, a bookseller as well. And we'd love you to buy it from us, not them. You know who them are. Um, it's been absolutely brilliant talking about uh, difficult women to um, Helen. Thank you so much, Helen, for spending this time with us for Book Club Live. Oh, thank you very much for having me. It's been great. Thank you. Um, so that is, uh, brings us to the end of this Book Club Live um, for Difficult Women with um, Helen Lewis. It's been such um, a pleasure uh, to spend some time with you on Sunday evening and going a bit deeper into Helen's book and her work. Uh, I ho hope you have a pleasant uh, rest of your Sunday evening uh, and hope to see you soon. This salon is now closed. Thank you. <laughs>